Next, we have a passage that deals with our Hidalgo's identity. Among a number of knights, or mosenes, an Aragonese term, all exemplary heroes from the 15th century, Don Quixote mentions Gutierre Quijada, specifying of whose nobility I am a direct heir by the male line. Pay attention here. This is a puzzle. Don Quixote then mentions the jousts of Suero de Quiñones, he of the pass, alluding to the defense of the Orbigo Bridge on the route of Santiago, performed by one Suero de Quiñones during an entire month in 1434, an act known as El Paso Honroso, or the Pass of Honor. As Francisco Rico points out, this was, in Cervantes' day, perhaps the most well-known chivalric exploit of the 15th century. By the way, Suero de Quiñones died in 1458, fighting a duel with, can you guess, Gutierre Quijada. In other words, Don Quixote finishes his spectacular rhetorical defense of chivalry by alluding to a famous knight who was defeated by his own ancestor somewhere on the road between Leon and Santiago. The medieval dialectical formation of the modern Spanish identity is the great lesson of this passage. There's another irony in the canon's final response. Ceding terrain to Don Quixote, he admits that the 12 peers of France, the Cid and Bernardo del Carpio, may have been real, although we should point out that their existence was hotly debated in the late 16th century. Even more interestingly, the canon hesitates when he characterizes the profession of these knights, saying that theirs was a kind of religious militancy, like those evoked by the orders of Santiago and Calatrava, which presupposes that those who profess it will be, and ought to be, brave, courageous, and well-born gentlemen. It's another labyrinth. Note that the Spanish knights idealized by Don Quixote are not characterized by their battles against the Moors, but rather by their gratuitous duels among themselves. In fact, his speech focuses on Spain before the Reconquista and the expulsion of the Moors. And when the canon hesitates about the behavior of the caballeros, of the religious and military orders, he forces us to once again inquire into the true definition of a knight or gentleman. Cervantes, has Don Quixote defend the chaotic mixture of literary genres that deal with realities and fantasies that are more or less historical or legendary in order to emphasize the injustice of those inquisitorial authorities who wanted to burn and banish both books and individuals whom they deemed useless or contaminated. The focus on battles between equally pure knights like Quiñones and Quijada makes for a similar effect, as if the author wanted to say to his readers that they should look to themselves before judging others. This kind of liberal and reformist philosophy might reflect the interior Christianity advocated by Renaissance humanists like Erasmus, who opposed the infamously rigid orthodoxy of Spain. The fact that the canon is left astonished and confused by the mixed nature of Don Quixote's wildly diverse speech underscores the hypocrisy of puritanical thinking. Let's review. This part of the novel is characterized by a platonic discussion of the role of literature in an orderly republic. Cervantes contemplates both Plato's and the humanists' sensorial attacks on fiction. However, note that Don Quixote escapes his confinement and that his physical need to make major waters undercuts all the theoretical arguments, marking them as pathetic and absurd in the face of the messiness of reality. We can admit that it's almost impossible to perceive a consistent message in all this, but perhaps the weakest point in the priest and the canon's logic is their idea to commission a national censor responsible for overseeing the production of comedies and chivalric novels. It's also remarkable that these religious authorities contradict themselves and reveal their personal biases. They even suffer from a literary mania similar to that of Don Quixote. In the end, it's difficult to take them seriously. Are their rarefied sacred texts really all that different from the imperfect novels of chivalry that they themselves seem to appreciate? 
What's more, here we sense that Don Quixote is somehow self-conscious of a need to teach us a kind of anti-racist tolerance. His attitude echoes his response to Sancho in chapter 25 when he admitted that he knew all about the true identity of Dulcinea del Toboso. What are we to make of the labyrinthine literary theory and the outrageous proposal of censorship in these chapters? Remember that these are views expressed by characters, not by Cervantes himself, and that irony and contradiction prevail throughout. What if we took all this thinking about literature as a kind of social allegory? Which useless people should be exiled from Spain? If we read one of Cervantes' own plays, El Retablo de las Maravillas, we'll find that our author often shouted, look who's talking at his more puritanical characters and spectators. And do not despair, for the final three chapters of the novel will help us to better understand Cervantes' literary theory, especially in terms of the aesthetic and moral advantages of the romances of chivalry. Four final observations. First, the episodes athemila, meaning both a supply mule and a kind of medieval tax, also means foolish man and is therefore roundly symbolic. Second, the canon is from Toledo, which was a site of great artistic activity frequented by Lope de Vega, El Greco, and Cervantes, and home to many reformist intellectuals. Its archbishop was Cervantes' patron, and the late scholastic philosopher Juan de Mariana lived there but it was also the site of one of the bloodiest tribunals of the Spanish Inquisition. Third, Sancho's scatology and empiricism contrast with the church's enchantments and illusions in this episode, and this basic conflict anticipates a major aspect of the philosophy of Thomas Hobbes. And fourth, there is much phallic symbolism in the knob of Pierres' wooden horse, which, according to Don Quixote, is tucked away in a leather case so that it won't get moldy. Is this another echo of the sodomy of the captive's tale? Another critique of the hypermasculinity of Spanish militarism? Perhaps a reference to the wooden beam of Luke chapter 6, verse 41. To ignore this problematic knob would be to avoid the subtlety of Cervantes' text.